Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Vito, and I am the Assistant Director of Development at Film at Lincoln Center. Along with IFC Films, we are thrilled to present a Q&A for The Dry, featuring director, co-writer, and producer Robert Connolly and star Eric Bana, moderated by author and film critic Thelma Adams. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, IFC and Film at Lincoln Center. And let's talk this wonderful movie, the Dry, an Australian noir. Why don't you tell us, it seemed to have happened to me to have come together quickly. How did this project come together? I was really lucky. Um, my, my very good friend, Bruna Papandrea, who's an Australian who's been working in the US producing, she produced Big Little Lies and Gone Girl and many other projects in the US. And she has a voracious appetite for reading. And she rang me one day and said, I've got this unpublished manuscript that's going to be massive. Would you like to read it and have a look? And I started uh, reading at about 7 p.m. and I finished about 5 a.m. <laughs> it's never happened to me before. I normally take a long time to decide, but I rang her that morning and I said, I loved it. It's incredible. I want to do this. What have we got to do next? So um, that, that's how it came to me. And so that was it, Jane it was un Harper's, unpublished. Jane Harper's novel as it was coming out. So you, That's saw right. the, it, you saw the manuscript and since then it's become a bestseller. I'm just curious right. because we all read a lot of things that we think, oh, this would make a perfect movie. I mean, obviously one thing is start it at seven, stop at five in the morning, but what was <laughs> gripping? You know, yes, that, that's, that tells that's you it's true. gripping, but what was, what was the, what, what clicked with you? And did you immediately Look, see I Eric in the lead role? Yeah, it's really an interesting question. So what clicked immediately for me was a kind of convergence of things that I love. So yes, it's got great plot and there's a great story, but you know, we, we watch a lot of television, you know, the world is full of plot and the mechanics in the engine room of plot um, is, is an attractive thing, but that's not, not everything for me and particularly with cinema. And what hit me was this landscape of characters, these incredible characters in this town and the next step was this world. You know, I grew up in the Blue Mountains outside of Sydney, so I grew up in the bush. And I just hadn't read something as visceral and real and compelling that took me as a reader. And I thought, I can take an audience here. I can take them into this world. And then I think the final piece is, you know, I, I love cinema where you take a protagonist on a journey that's emotional, that's cathartic, that's funny, that's thrilling. And here was this incredible uh, protagonist, Aaron Falk, you know, a man damaged by events in his past, looking to the future. I read the book, hoping, as great drama makes you, hoping that he would triumph over the adversarial situations of his life. Um, and of course, immediately thought of Eric, uh, who, who I work with, who I share this office with, and we, we talked pretty quickly about it. And after I read it. So, what, so what did you think? What, when you first heard about it, Eric, from Robert, what was the pitch? What did you think? When did you read it? What do you think of this character? Um, well, I'd actually already read the book. Um, my wife was a, was a fan of The Dry and had, had given it to me along with every other, I think, adaptation I've ever done. And I, I love the book and I just, um, I don't think Robert and I had discussed it. And then one day we're in the office and he got off the phone and told me that he was he was contemplating directing The Dry. And I said, well, you mean the Jane Harper novel? He's like, yeah. I said, well, I've, I've read that and I, I loved it. And we just sat right where he is right now and looked at each other and went, well, maybe, because we'd been trying to collaborate again um, for years. We did Romulus, My Father together 12 years ago and had, have always looked for another piece of material to collaborate on. And then this came along and it was just, and I knew Bruna as well from many years ago, who Rob's very close friends with. And and it was just very immediate. You could just kind of like feel the, spark, the electricity in the air that we were all on the same page and could see the potential for, for the film. I, I loved the book. I thought it was incredibly cinematic and felt very close to my heart because of Jane's depiction of of this little country town, which which really rang true to me, you know, as someone that's from the city but spends a lot of time in in the country. It's kind of the 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 countryside that we city folk identify with, as opposed to the kind of normal depiction of the outback. This is how we connect to the bush through these little towns. And I thought it was a compelling story. I love 
the character of Aaron and, and felt really protective of him. So when the opportunity came up, it was just immediate. I'm curious, what did you identify with him? Where did you kind of connect with this character? I don't know that I that I, that was like a, a a specific connection, but it was just I was intrigued by by the story, and I love this notion um, of someone having to return to a town. It was almost, almost had a, a you know after 20, 25 years, almost like a school reunion that you really don't want to go to. And as soon as you say that, you you know people feel it in their body. You know what I mean? And that's that's what Aaron's confronted with. And I love the premise. I loved everything about his predicament. And he's and and in the present, he's created a full character, a full human that does not isn't doesn't ident identify with this town and the and the horror that happened in this town. And now he has to come back and confront it. Which is which I think there's a lot of noir where it's a person from the town goes to the big city, becomes a big city cop and then comes back and is the fish out of water. That's yeah, it's like the in, interesting. Um, we talked a lot about that idea that in life, which is the universality of the story, which we loved, that even though it's set very specifically in this Australian um, country area, the universality of in life, a lot of us stay where we grew up and a lot of us leave. And if you put those two people, you know, if you put two people, someone who stayed and someone who left and you put them together, there's great drama in it. In the and, and the film doesn't judge either choice, as we see in the character of Gretchen, wonderful performance from Genevieve O'Reilly. But, you know, right. if you if you put these two people in some form of dramatic situation, um, it's fascinating to watch. I know from my own childhood, going back to the Blue Mountains where I grew up and you know, running into the girl that I had a crush on when I was 13 and there she was in the supermarket and she'd moved, you know, 100 feet down the road from where she grew up and now had a family. And um, I think that person that personally was a really appealing uh, thematic element of Jane Harper's wonderful book as well. Um, this, the notion of the dry to me, since I've read a lot of noir that's based in Los Angeles or New York, the dry seems to me to be parallel to, say, Dashiell Hammett or Raymond Chandler when they do the Santa Ana winds. So there's Santa Ana winds during what during the period that the story unspools, and not only is it hot and windy, but some but it stirs everybody up, like everybody's on edge. Do you, so what is the dry? Is it a similar thing, or would you say yeah, that there's a different quality? Yeah, no, I think that's a great kind of comparison. I mean, I think that um, at the heart of each of Jane Harper's books is landscape and uh, and the environment, but I think they work very metaphorically uh, in terms of creating a world, um, you know, to place our protagonist in. I think of the scene um, in the film where uh, it's very early on, so it's not really a spoiler for people yet to see it, but. Um, you know, where Aaron Fork stands in an empty river, a dead empty river, and remembers 30 years before as a teenager swimming in that river. And I think that speaks very much to the psychology of this man too, um, who was broken by things in the past. And so I, I really love the way Jane Harper entwines hand in glove the past and the present and uses landscape metaphorically to kind of speak of the human condition, you know, to apply the microscope really, which cinema can do really well um, to aspects of the human condition. And Eric, how, how, how did you change the character? Or how did you come to the character? Or is it very much true to the character on the page? It's very similar to the character on the page. Um, one of the reasons that I think everyone was felt so passionately about this this uh, project from the from the get go was we were real lovers of the book and we, we weren't using the book as a kind of jumping off point. We really wanted to be true as fans of the book to to the book and to satisfy its its readers. But Rob and I really felt that the, the two areas that that there was room for elevation was obviously, you know, the cinematic scope of, of, of what we could do and that Aaron's journey for it to be as emotional as possible and for us to flesh that out as much as possible and not to get just caught up in the procedure of this 
of the raw elements which were there, which were fantastic in, in terms of it being a thriller slash whodunit. But there was this incredible, um, incomplete, emotionally uh, incomplete character of Aaron Fork that 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 um, his journey could provide some completion and. Um, that was what we really con concentrated on, and and it really was fleshed out with, with the character of um, Gretchen, obviously played by Genevieve O'Reilly, who was just was uh, there's no other word for it. She's she's perfect. Her performance is perfect, and um, and it was a thrill to to do some of those scenes with her, and that that sort of really anchored the the the, the present, and obviously we had those four amazing young actors representing us as as teenagers, which was the kind of emotional backstory for us all. Right, uh, that, that leads to another question I had for later, but it fits right now, which is how did you pair up? How, you know, you were cast first and then they cast a younger you. How did you decide what were the, what, what were the similarities? Were, did you have notes? Did you kind of observe each other or was it, I guess this is a Robert question because he's manipulating you both directing <laughs> it's interesting i've quite enjoyed the way uh, you know my whole journey is to try and make sure cinema is less of a technical exercise i think as my career's progressed it's trying to kind of make it's very hard you know cinema is such an industrial process there's so many technical things that go on and you're trying to make it feel like you're splashing paint on a canvas every day in this industrial world and so rather than kind of, you know, artificially come up with things and mannerisms they both have, and I, I actually just let uh, Eric and Joe Klotchek meet and have a chat. Joe's an amazing young emerging actor. Eric, you know, was able to give him some advice in his career and the two of them were able to meet. But, but I was kind of wear, very wary of actually setting up you know, mannerisms or things that would actually, I, I was probably more looking just for the spirit of the character. Um, and of course, Joe Klocek plays the character much younger before he's damaged by certain events that, that uh, Aaron Fork later on is affected by. So they are in a different headspace. Um, but yeah, and there's a little bit of magic, I think, when you're a director, you just get out of the way occasionally and you let actors absorb and contemplate and think things. Um, but that's as much to say that there, there was no real technical process of, of marrying past and present with those performances. So I'm delighted to, to see how well it works. Eric, do you want to talk about that a little bit, about what you talked about with your younger counterpart? Yeah, well, the, 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 the thing that I remember Rob and I talking about was just making sure that, you know, Joe felt a sense of freedom. Um, so it was just about making him feel really comfortable. I didn't want him to feel as though... Um, you know, he had to man manufacture a, a kind of younger version of me. Like, just trust the casting process. You're casting this role. There's enough similarity there. Don't just just be free. You know, like he's a great young actor, and 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 I think that's there. I think his performance is is really li liberated, and and he's just he's just wonderful. So so it was at, like Rob was saying, it was as much about just getting out of his way and just making him feel confident and comfortable. That whatever he was going to bring was 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 going to work. It's interesting. I felt like he was such a an actor who so listened. Like you watch him in a scene, and he's really listening and observant. You know, his other counterpart, the other young man, is obviously active and acting out. That's the way the character's written. But you, as a younger man, there's just such a listening to him. Such a he's so kind of holding back to see what's going to happen. Well, it's an intelligence from an actor, you know, it's, it's a young actor who is, who's completely aware of, of the script, the scripted parts that he's not in, right? I mean, it's like the, the, the <laughs> textbook of, uh, of someone reading all the pages, not just the scenes that they're in and understanding what I was going to be bringing and that and that his his representation spiritually needed to be the same without it necessarily being a like a physical reenactment. So it, it, you're exactly right. Scratch, it's a, his, scratch his cheek and then you scratch your cheek. You know, it's not exactly <laughs> exactly. It's it's an essence of the, the essence of seeing a little bit of the older Aaron in the younger Aaron, which I'm sure that Joe just got from from Rob's writing. As I'd say that I scratch my nose and. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have to go back and um, what is this emotional arc is also, you know, did you shoot it sequentially? 
or did you move back and forth? <laughs> it is so because the arc is such a slow burn of your of your thought, character and his and his emotional life. Yeah, I did uh, one of the worst things you can do to an actor, and it was largely because you know you can imagine this dry world and this these two worlds that have to interlock, right. and one is wet and bird life and green and the other one 30 years later post this world of climate change we're in it's dry and, and so unfortunately because of the mechanics of how we did that uh, i needed to do the worst thing you can do to an actor and, and eric had to do some of the later scenes in the film very early in the shoot um which is frustrating having said that for the younger actors less experienced than than eric I was able to build a chronological journey for them. So they were able to plot their story from beginning to end in a chronological way, which was fantastic um, because, you know, it's uh, really helpful if you can do that. It's, it's not often possible because of the logistics of a shoot, but, you know, definitely with emerging actors, I was able to, to get it in a chronological line. But Eric, on the other hand, <laughs> I threw in the deep end so on the first day of the Eric, shoot. on the other hand. <laughs> How did, you know, how did you, when you shot it, where was your big scene in, in, in terms of where was it shot in the order of the scenes? <laughs> first. Uh, so it was my first day. I think we were almost, it was almost a pre-production day and it was pretty much the second last scene of the film, um, you know, which I guess is a, it's a great reminder for any young actor. And I've been in that position before that, you know, you better on day one be ready ready for day thirty five. Um, you know, you can't. You, film doesn't allow us this this idea of just kind of like easing our way into the character. And if you don't know the character on day one, you you, you can really really be be caught out. And um, yeah. And also, you know, you had just have to go in with a sense of freedom that tell yourself that if it doesn't work, you're going to maybe reshoot it even though we probably wouldn't have had the budget for that. But that's a trick I like to play <laughs> uh, for myself. Right. Um, but in I'll this have case, another chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Robert, how was that? How was that for you? How do you in the two of you interact? Obviously, you share an office. Um, how yeah, it's been um, notes or when, when do you talk about the nut of the character and then watch it and then respond? And how do you respond? Yeah, it's really interesting territory and something that's evolved in my career. And um, I think this idea that you engage in a, in a conversation with an actor about the character, about the story, about where they fit into it, about what you're thinking about the scene. Um, and it's become less, again, probably less technical and more you working with wonderful actors, you're trying to have a common understanding of what the scene is. And then, you know, the shoot, provides you a certain amount of time to explore the scene. You know, we had a wonderful um, first assistant director who's done some of Australia's biggest films. Eric had worked with him before I had, we'd have a chat with him. It's okay, we've got two and a half hours for this scene. And and with this amazing cinematographer, uh, Stefan Duccio, who's known in the US, he did The Invisible Man and other films, he's an amazing emerging cinematographer. I try and make it feel like an exploration of the scene rather than I'm looking for some definitive truth that I'm trying to, that I've rehearsed and I'm trying to replicate on set. I've tried to break out of that idea. So it's more, here we are, this is what the scene, you know, and then we just explore it. And, and, you know, give or take a couple of times in the shoot, you know, we managed to crack the scene. And, the, and the, you know, there was one time I was really struggling. I just couldn't, in the time allotted, I couldn't work out how to get the scene working. And uh, in that case, Eric and I just took a moment. I just said to everyone, we need five minutes. And Eric and I just walked away and we just talk about it and try something new and something fresh. Um, and, I, and I love that. It, it makes me feel really creative. It, it reminds me of something I heard Jane Campion say one time that you rehearse and you, you know, on set and you get the scene till it's truthful. And the minute it feels truthful, you shoot it as fast as you can <laughs> because it's like it's got a half-life. It's disappearing in front of your eyes. And, and, uh, and that's the real joy for me of directing. You, you embrace every scene. It's why I never really think that directing, it's not rocket science. It's like a creative journey with other creative people and your actors and your cinematographer being at the heart of that. Um, and that was, that was our what process, was that really. What, what specific scene did that happen? 
Uh, it was the scene at the cemetery um, when Falk uh, confronts Mal Deacon at Ellie's grave, right. you know, and I'd written, I'd actually written a scene where they have a physical confrontation and it was physical confrontation in the book and the physical, con the mechanics of the physical confrontation just, just didn't feel truthful. I kept looking at it thinking, this is fake. This is cinema language. This is screen right. language. This isn't what really would happen here. Uh, which I think, and then so, you know, Eric and I explored it and Eric just said, and it's quite a bold thing, we've been rehearsing. I mean, this is a scene we'd probably have to come back and shoot again if we don't get it right. And Eric said, "What? Well, just let us have the conflict verbally. Let's just see if we just have it verbally. Let's remove any physical, con let's stay apart. And I came back and said, okay, let's try it. And And there's this really incredible moment on set when, you know, between action and cut, I, I like to be surprised. I, I don't want it to replicate something. I. You know, so I set the scene up and I call action and I watch these two great actors do the scene differently and it, and it started to feel truthful and honest again. Um, and it was very different to how I'd written it and conceived it and how it was written in the book. But um, it unlocked that scene, that one idea. So, and that's, that's the fun and the joy of directing. I mean, there's the pressures on set, but it is that playful exploration of the material that I tried to reach for as a director. And, I, and as a result, I think the performances are liberated a bit from that, from the technical right. precision of a performance. And Eric, how did it feel inside that? So what you've created is hostility, this hostile energy between the two characters that is expressed through the dialogue, but you're not physically fighting. That's right. Yeah, I, I remember the day very well. And it, it was, it was, um, Immediate, there was something that was immediately apparent in the first rehearsal, and sometimes it's hard to disassemble something like that because it's like you've got a you've got a stunt coordinator because William had to fall down, and it was, and it becomes this whole thing. And it's what I love about working with with Robert and directors like that who can see when something's not working and then and then fix it as opposed to just being completely wedded to an idea that they've written down and it must be this way. It must, must, must be this way. I we would have had to have gone and reshot that scene. I remember in in in, in pre-production, Rob and I talking about how the essential elements of the film were so strong, is all we had to do was just not stuff up. We just had this feeling was like we just can't make a single mistake. If we just don't stuff up one scene, this will this this will work. Um, and and in terms of the working relationship, obviously we hugely benefited from the fact that you know, every conversation in, in the planning and pre-production was had in that space that Rob is in right now, this office that we share. So it was a huge advantage for me, one that I don't normally get because I'm flying in two or three or four weeks before a film begins and then I'm out when it's finished. So to be that closely involved was, you know, an indulgence and just a, a gift for, for, for both of us. And I, I just love that collaboration when I get to work with directors that, that create, as stressful as it may be, I never felt like we were under a time crunch. Rob did this great trick of being relaxed every day, no matter what the schedule was. And it just <laughs> creates a relaxing environment for the actors to just go about their work and discover things. And it just felt like fun. I mean, it was one of the most fun shoots I've ever been a part of. It's a little heavy, but just kind of, I love the way that it was fun for you when you watch it. It's a very, it's a dark film. Also, when, did you shoot it during the pandemic? How did that relate? How did, did you shoot it before the pandemic, during the pandemic? What, what just was before, that? Actually. Just before, actually. Yeah, just before. So we, we completed the shoot um, before the pandemic and then finished post-production during uh, which, you know, where we're based here, there's an amazing sound facility nearby. And um, my only great regret during that time was that the wonderful um, composer, Peter Rayburn, who's based in Los Angeles, he, he recorded his wonderful score with a 40 piece strings and a little um, chamber orchestra at Abbey Road in the UK, in the famous studio too, where the Beatles had recorded their album and I couldn't go. <laughs> That's one of my, and it's like, will I ever record another score for one of my films at Abbey Road? I don't know. All I know is I was here and they were there. But um, <laughs> now you, but that look, was it's, on your bucket list, something that you want to record at Abbey Road. I know. It's beautiful know. music. He's, he's a very, a very gifted uh, composer and he had a great emotional connection to the material and 
I, I look at some of the scenes and I can see him unlocking the scenes. He's, he's very good at looking into the psychology of the character and, and making sure the music kind of elevates the psychology of the character in a certain moment. Um, but no, yeah, so we were pre, pre-pandemic, but it was a tough time when we filmed. It was uh, a time of drought here, of bushfires. And, you know, I think back to the um, tragic bushfires at a similar time that were happening in California as well. Right. Um, and uh, so, so there was environmental threat. It, it felt um, uh, that the ever-present danger of the environment was part of what it was to make that film. Like the, the fear of climate change. That, this, right. that 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 the dry is not going to stop. That's right. That's right. Is this the way it is now? You know, and you've got to think that where we filmed, that's our food bowl here in in Melbourne. It's four and a half hours from here, and right. um, and we take it for granted that whole world. So actually, you know, taking the crew out there, being living there, being based there. I mean, I love that as a filmmaker. You know, taking everyone somewhere, and, and then, then the it, letting it. Abs- yeah, absorb into the DNA of the film. And then to take an audience now in the US to a part of the world they've never seen before, right. um, you know, rather than to a studio somewhere where we're recreating something, actually to take you there and to, to show you that world is part of the joy I love in watching films as well. Right. I have a question from um, an audience member, Eunice. She said, I really enjoy the movie. Um, and I, there's a little spoiler. I found the editing between current and past timelines effective. Did you take cues from the book or did you have to think about their integration in a different way for the film? That's a great question, Eunice. And because in the book, if you go and have a look at the book, all the flashbacks are um, shuffled up. So in the book, she goes to different time frames, but not in a chronological order. And one of the things I talked to Jane Harper about very early was that I felt in a film that the flashbacks needed to have a chrono- chronological journey so that every time you went to them, you felt like this, except for the very first flashback, um, you felt like the story was leaning forward. Um, so it is different. The flashbacks themselves aren't that different. It's just we, we ordered them in a more, uh, a more linear chronological That's way. That's interesting to me. Okay, Eric, I'm sorry, Eric, you were going to say something? No, no, no. I was just, I was just scratching myself. No, and, uh, but, but and I remember now we have that to get the young actor to scratch himself the same way. Um. The, 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 it was something that was really. Um, it had a lot of definitive shape in the script and when we were filming. But, but Rob identified very early on in pre-production that 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 this that the pure structure of that was really going to identify itself in the edit. And we were fortunate enough to have a have a long edit to get to get that right. And Rob was and our editors were just so so meticulous. And it just found it found a rhythm. And 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 I remember seeing it. You know, Rob had it carded on the wall, and you could see where the flashbacks would would emerge, and when it felt like the film really really needed it. And it changed shapes many 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 times. But I think the the, the balance is is right. And I think Rob and the editors did an amazing job in the end of finding the correct balance as Eunice was asking about. What is that, I, what's kind of the rule of thumb of like how much in the present, it's a, it's a question about narrative structure. How much do you feel like you have to do in the present before you're allowed a flashback and how okay. long do you stay back before you have to, you know, there's a balance. My, yeah, my, my editor, Nick Myers, who cut a film that I did uh, in 2009, Balibo, Oscar Isaac and Anthony LaPaglia, which has a similar structure. Mm-hmm. And he had this idea, which was our guiding principle. And it was that you should always leave the time frame you're in, so the present, at a point where you don't want to leave it, where you're wondering what's about to happen. So that you have that feeling of, oh my God, no, I don't want to leave there. And then you go to the past and you're immediately happy to be back there because you want to find out. And then in the past, you get to a point where you're similarly feeling I want to know what happens next in the past and then you're dragged into the present. So his idea is you create a tension between the past and present. It's it's this philosophical approach to, I guess, cinema, which allows you to be quite slow at times in the pace, but as long as it always feels like it's leaning forward, you know, it's, it's so that the film is, you know, dragging you forward towards some inevitable place that will conclude the story. 
And so I think that was our guiding principle. If we ever got stuck in it, if we were just in a time frame and getting bored with it and thought, oh, we should go to the past. Well, that was the wrong, we were cutting to the past too late. We right. should have cut to the past earlier in that scene. Um, but look, six month edit, uh, you know, Nick Myers, Alexander DeFranceschi, these amazing editors, uh, an inc six month edit, like a really long process to cut. I, I really subscribe to the view that a script is written three times, uh, you know, on the page during the shoot and in the edit, you know, and I'd be lying to the, um, to the viewers today if I said that we cracked it all on the page because we didn't. <laughs> right. You know, it took a long time and there was a lot of rewriting going on in the shoot too, in the edit too. There's your there's your truck on the street. So Eric, can you tell me, Eunice had another question, which is what's the American release plan? Yeah, so we we open up this this week on the 21st um, and we're, we're simultaneous um, uh, video on demand along with I think at the last count where we're in quite a lot of uh, a great number of physical theaters like 150 at a, at, a, at a minimum which for a film like this is is incredible I mean I've I've been in indie American films that you know struggle to be on 20 or 30 screens so we're really excited I've seen uh, doing an amazing job and getting the film out to people and um, we feel really really excited I think one of the you know, take this the best possible way. One of the worst things we could have done with this story was set it in Texas. Like this, this book was so specific to its environment in in this country town um, that I, I hope that the American audience see it as, as a gift that they get to be truly transported, especially at a time when no one can travel. Like they will feel like they've spent two hours in a country town in a way that is very unique compared to other depictions of, of the countryside in other Australian films. Quite often, our, 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 the, 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 can be a temptation to present like the outback, you know, and a lot of caricature and so forth. And we were at pains to not only do justice to, to the book, but to be 100% authentic. And one of the reasons we think that the film was such a massive success here in Australia was that every single person outside of the city went, yes, this is, this is true to how we feel about being a country person. This is what it's like. And this, is, this, this does show our struggle that, that when, when the land is, is, is unable to, to feed us and, 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 and you have drought and, and all these elements, that affect you psychologically, that affect you, you know, your your in, in, internal balance and and on a practical level, um, the, the, the bottom line of the town. The, the town on the poster of the one sheet of the film that we shot in Beulah had no drinking water when, when we were filming there. Their drinking water would be trucked in once a week. And um, that's just a small example of, of what, what, you know, people are in for in this film. Mm. And, it, you know, I always feel that in a movie like this, that it has to be authentic, that it should be in Australia. Yeah. When you, and this is my opinion, not the film, the film of Lincoln Center opinion. My opinion is when you have a movie that's great, like Another Round, don't turn it into an American movie because what's essentially authentic about it is the Danish culture or is, in this case, the Australian culture. And in this case, yeah. also, this is a huge hit in Australia. What are what were you number thirteen in the all time box office in Australia? Is that true? That's right. It yeah, it's been a, it's been no, that's it's been massive success here, which and also wonderful for our friends in exhibition. You know, bringing people back to the cinema. There was a lot of discussion in Australia last year. Is the future streaming? Is the future about just watching right. things online? And, you know, I've got such a great passion and Eric and I share this, for, you know, the collective experience of going to the cinema or of, uh, and, you know, so it was wonderful that the dry um, was able to be such a massive hit in Australia on, you know, opening on January 1 in the middle of the pandemic here. Um, and, and subsequently that our friends at IFC have managed to, you know, you know, work out a way to release it um, in the US, you know, theatrically as well. You know, the film is shot large format on the you know first Australian film to shoot this way. And, you know, it's massive um, cinematic scale that, you know, is probably responding to the challenge thrown down to all of us filmmakers at the moment, which is how to make things compel people to see them in the cinema when there's so much great stuff on the small screen as well. Also, I'm curious, just 
because I think American audience, what was it like in January when it opened in Australia? Were people going to the movie theaters? Were there special rules? Did people have to wear masks or had things gone back to relative normal? It was different, wasn't it, around, I think in Victoria, it was masks still in the cinema. Uh, Eric, is that right? I think it was yeah, different. Well, I mean, Australia split our country. It was a bit of a patchwork quilt in different states. So we had some very heavy restrictions in some of our states. And, and, then, and then Sydney actually went into a lockdown shortly after we opened and, and, and uh, partial lockdown in terms of area. And there were a lot of restrictions. So part of the success of the film, the phenomenon is that it was that it, it happened during a time when there were pretty pretty stringent physical restrictions on on capacity in cinema and so forth and it was ourselves and i think wonder woman on jan one that that were the first films to try and lure people people off the street and into into cinemas and but but predominantly um for most of that period yeah people were, were wearing a mask in the cinema and very safe the COVID safe practices in cinemas proved to be very, very good. You know, as a form of collective experience, it, it um, you know, it proved to actually be a very safe way and cinemas took it very seriously. So I think um, that was quite wonderful too, like that we weren't part of a story about how, you know, the dry had brought people back to the cinema and helped spread the, you know, right. this terrible situation. No, and I, and I think the way cinemas, and I, I've been watching how cinemas are handling it in the US with great responsibility too. So um, it's exciting. People are going back to the movies. It's great. And how does Jane, how does Jane feel about it? Uh, did she watch it with you? Did she watch an early cut? What's you know, people. She's, in, she's actually in the she's film. In it. She does a little cameo in the film. If anyone who is a fan of Jane Harper's writing and her other books um, takes another look at the funeral scene, she's got a little cameo. Um, and she read early drafts and she had a look at it later in the edit and then saw it when it was completed. And the, the screening when it was completed, where she, she came with her husband and her mum and dad were in Australia from the UK and we had a little screening. I was pacing around outside so nervous because I had such respect for her book and the fact that she loved the film and responded so well to it was a great um, relief because you feel like an author, it's her first book, an author gives you a book like that to adapt and it's important to her. It's always going to be the most important book to her because it launched her career and, uh, and she, you know, she, uh, she really enjoyed the film, which was wonderful. Which is good. And uh, does she have other books that have coming out have come out since? Yeah, she's had three other books. Uh, there's a second book um, which has the character of Aaron Falk in it, and continues the journey of the dry. There's another book, The Lost Man, um, which is a fascinating kind of thriller set right out in the, the most remote parts of Australia. And then her first, uh, her fourth book's just come out now, The Survivors. So you know, she's kind of. Um, uh, having quite a massive a and successful career, you know, four, four books in. Um, now what's next for the both of you? Now you're going to, wh where's the film going to open? It's going to be the United States. Is it, is it opening internationally? Has it done that already? And then what are you each planning to do next? Uh, it's amazing. It's the first uh, since our great um, release here. The US is the, the next step, which is fantastic. And then it travels from there around the world throughout the European territories, the UK and um, in Asia. So we'll see over the rest of this year, the film be released um, globally. Um, and uh, I've just finished directing another film, Blueback, which is a big um, eco drama about a mother and a young 16 year old living in a remote bay and it's pretty much about saving our oceans. It's a, a narrative work from one of our great authors here, Tim Winton. And uh, I've, I've just finished that shoot. So I'm in, I'm in the edit on that film now and Eric's um, got a role in that and actors, people would know me, of Shakovska from Alice in Wonderland and mm -hmm. uh, Rada Mitchell, who's obviously done a lot of work in the US and this amazing young 16 oh, yeah. year old in her first film. So that that's, you know, I've got to have to pinch myself. I've been able to make another film. And Eric, what's on your horizon? Uh, I spent most of the um, the pandemic working on a, a screenplay that Rob and I have been developing for, for quite some time um, about 
the uh, story about Mike Haywood's comeback. Uh, it's one of the great sporting comeback stories um, ever, actually, about Mike Haywood, who was, was a world champion motorcycle racer in the 70s, who took 10 years away from the sport and returned to the Isle of Man road race um, out of retirement to, to compete. And that's something we've been working on, which we'll love to turn into a into a feature but um in terms of in terms of acting wise um i'm not i'm not really sure i did a little role in blue back the film that rob just just mentioned in western australia and i'm just um going through the pile right now trying to uh, work out my ne my next move my next um my next project i mean i'm in no rush i, I think it's going to be a um a more interesting landscape as we get towards the end of this year in terms of choice and, and until the uk gets back to a more regular sort of shooting environment and the US, um, I'm happy to sort of sort of wait it out and 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 see where it's till I fall in love with another script, which is what I always try and do. I have one so one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Um what why would you why do you think the movies are important? I mean not like in general, blah blah blah, but what do you think is the element that will keep people going to theaters as opposed to sitting on their couch? I just think we're we're social animals. Like we we it's the collective experience of things. You know, we we love going and supporting sport and sharing the experience of watching a sporting event. We love going to birthdays and weddings and gathering with the people we love. And and I think cinema has has always been. A, a, you know, we like going to restaurants and having dinner with our friends. We and cinema's always been that collective experience and. You know, I read a great study they did here in Australia and that found that it was something like 90% of people that see a movie when they leave the film want to engage with the ideas of the film. It's why Q&As are wonderful and it's why people hang in the, in the foyer or they go out for dinner after they've seen the film. And um, so, so that's my, my view. We, 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 we love sharing things together collectively and the cin cinema is this unique place where you can watch something at the same time with people that are friends and strangers and, um, and engage with it. Excellent. And what about you, Eric? Do you have another a comment on that subject? Yeah, I do. I mean, we're, we're all old enough to remember when when video stores first started and it was meant to be the end of cinema and it never happened and cinema's never been stronger. And then you know, along comes new challenges. I actually think we're in an incredible place now because one of the reasons I personally love going to the cinema is the doorbell doesn't ring and no one's on their phone. <laughs> and there, it's one of the few places where there are no distractions, literally like um, I, I much prefer, I'm a member of the Academy and I always try to get to the cinema to, to, to watch the screenings of the films, you know, largely because I don't want to be disturbed at home and I don't want to watch it on my laptop. So um, there is nothing like it. And I, and I think as society progresses to be more distracted, the, 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 the ritual of sitting in it, and there is nothing like the projected image of light traveling through a room and, and ending up on a screen in any form, whether it be film or digital, it is completely different to us um, viewing something at, at home. So I'm I'm a big fan of the cinematic experience and the big challenges for directors like Rob and filmmakers is to keep making things that compels us to see it on the big screen. Every decision made on this film in every department was knowing that this was for a cinematic experience and, and a, a cinematic launch. So. Um, we hope that, that your audience can tell the difference. Definitely, we can. Um, is there anything else or should we wrap it up and say what a fabulous film that was? I really, really enjoyed it. And I'll be recommending it to people to go and see it in the theater. Thank you. It was lovely to chat. Thanks to you so today. much, Thelma. Thanks for Thank the time. You. It was really, really wonderful. Thank you.